behalf of SPE Lagos section, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special and important event. Um, we welcome in a special way our distinguished guests who have taken time out of their very busy schedule to, to join us here today. Um, at this event, we will talk about uh, how the oil and gas industry can promote gender diversity and position itself as an employer of choice for the tech generation. Um, strategies for how women in the work, workforce can uh, progress in their career will also be shared. So feel free, relax and ask those burning questions that you have in your mind. Uh, the session, I promise you, is going to be engaging and interactive. Yes. So to kickstart the event, uh, permit me to run you through what to expect um, at this session today. Uh, following an opening remark by our very special section chair, we will introduce our special guests. A keynote address will be delivered and this will be followed by a panel address by each individual member of the panel. Um, this will take us into the, prop the panel discussion proper and you will have the opportunity at this time to ask those questions that you have in your heart. Um, you can always post your question via the Q&A chat box and we will take it from there and ask the panel session, the panel members. Uh, I'm sure they will try to address all your questions as they come in. Um, our section director will wrap up the panel discussions and after which we will introduce or we would um, highlight the activities that are being planned in the section. Um, we will end the event by a vote of thanks by our programs chair. So um, let's get into the business of the day with a safety brief. For our safety brief, I'd love to remind us that COVID-19 is still out there. It's, uh, it's real. So please continue to maintain uh, safety precautions. Wash your hands frequently. Use alcohol-based sanitizer. Wear face masks when you're out in public. Uh, remember to maintain social distance. Avoid large gatherings as much as possible. And if you do feel sick or feel any symptoms of COVID-19, we have shared the NCDC hotline on the screen. Please call the number. Now, permit me to welcome the section chair, Mr. Michael Oyeri, to give us the opening remarks. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Um, the keynote speaker, Mr. Chikezi Mosu, Distinguished panelists, Mrs. Lucien Shalanke Bunje, Ms. Zara Alkabi, Ms. Bitumelo Shalake, Mr. Sheyi Adeleye, the moderator, Mrs. Obiano Jibukwe, SPE members joining us from Nigeria and across the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this very apt and timely event themed promoting diversity and inclusion in the oil and gas industry. There's been a lot of discussion around the technical and commercial transformations required to move our industry forward. These range from digitalization and driving up efficiencies to bringing down the unit operating cost of producing a barrel of oil. While I do agree that these conversations are very vital for our industry at these times, it is also very important to note that the discussions we will be having today around diversity and inclusion is definitely an equally important one in ensuring the forward transformation and sustainability of our industry. A number of research has revealed that the oil and gas industry is one of the least gender diverse industries when compared with other major industries, largely having women participation at less than 35%. Another critical diversity issue our industry faces is skills shortage resulting from a wide gap between the few millennials and the many baby boomers in the industry, which hasn't allowed for adequate knowledge transfer and reskilling as well. The two sub themes that will be discussed today have been strategically developed to address these concerns with a view to providing implementable solutions. The first theme, women in the workplace, strategies for shattering the glass ceiling, will be highlighting the practical actions women can take to overcome possible barriers 
to career progression. While the second theme, closing the workforce generational gap, strategies for attracting and retaining the tech generation. We'll focus on the opportunities the industry can leverage to attract and retain the new generation of oil and gas professionals. I am confident that with the range of professionals and experts we have on the panel today, together with you, our very resourceful audience, who will be actively participating via the Q&A session of this live event, will identify the key DNI indicators, understand the barriers that prevent our industry from addressing DNI issues, and eventually arrive at solutions for closing the gender and generational gap here in Nigeria and globally as well. Let me therefore conclude by asking that you take your time to participate fully today. Please ask questions, let's share knowledge and keep the conversation on the front burner. This is the aim of today's gathering. So on this note and on behalf of SPE Lagos section, I once again welcome you to this event and wish every one of us a very successful deliberation. Thank you very much for joining us today. Back to you, Priscilla. Thank you, section chair. Um, so I'd be introducing our moderator in the person of Mrs. Obianuju Ibokwe. Obianu Jibokwe is our community chairperson for SP Legal Section. Um, please go to the next slide, Princess. Obiana is a senior petroleum engineer with Schlumberger. She's a PT with the Schlumberger Digital and Integration Group, and she has over 15 years of experience in the upstream sector of the oil and gas industry. Um, Uju has functioned in various technical roles in the subsurface and surface domain, and she has carried out several projects in the areas of production optimization, reservoir characterization, field-wide development planning, asset evaluation, and new business development. She holds a master's degree in petroleum engineering and project management from the Institute of Petroleum Studies, uh, which is a collaboration between the IFP France and University of Port Harcourt. Um, she's the current SP Legal Section Community Chairperson. Um, Uju, you're welcome to today's event. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Priscilla. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. All right, I hope we are all set to engage in a rich conversation on the way forward for diversity and inclusion. Just to let you know that I have my coffee, notepad and pen, and I'm all set to take notes. And I hope you are too. Okay, we will be kickstarting with the keynote speech, promoting diversity and inclusion in the oil and gas industry by our own special guest in the person of Mr. Chiki Musu. Right after his speech, we will dive into the panel discussions to talk about the key topic and sub themes for this event. Before I hand over to Mr. Chike, permit me to tell you a bit about Mr. Chike. I'm sure many of us are very familiar with Mr. Chike as he is a very special friend to SPE Lagos section. Now, Mr. Chike Zie Mosu is the CEO of Walter Smith Petroman. Next slide, please. Okay, Mr. Chike Zemosu is the CEO of Walter Smith Petroman. He is an experienced senior executive with 30 years local and international experience in the oil and gas industry. He has demonstrated expertise in the management of upstream and upstream oil and gas projects, new business development, divestments and acquisitions, midstream gas and downstream refining. And guess what? He delivered Nigeria's first modular refinery amidst the COVID-19 pandemic in October 2020. Mr. Chikeze is a strong energy professional with a proven track record of excellence. 
in managing technical and non-technical businesses, project risks and opportunities. His career was majorly with Shell, both in the Nigeria and in the international front, then with Sinopec ADAX and currently with Walter Smith. So, Mr. Chikeze, please, you have the floor now. We thank you for joining us this morning. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can, sir. Yes. OK, thank you, Abiyan Uju. Thank you, um, Mike. Thank you, SP Lagos. Um, that's my section as well. Um, I would like to, um, you know, first start by seeing the slides up so that um, we can walk through the conversation. Um, I, I, while putting together this material, um, I learned quite a lot, and I hope I can take you through this same journey of learning. I can't see the slides up yet. Okay, so um, if you go to the next slide, I'll show an outline of um, you know what I will be discussing um, or presenting as a keynote speech. If you go to the next slide. All right, if there's some difficulty, let me just talk through uh, things until we start seeing um, the slides a little better. So the outline of the um, discussion, I won't call it a keynote speech. I'll talk about a couple of topics around the issue of uh, diversity and inclusion. I'll talk about inclusive leadership, diversity networks, why clients and suppliers, it's not just about you're having diversity and inclusion in your company, but you have to extend it to clients and suppliers. The need for role models and supporters. And there I'll talk about the need for key, um, you know, type of support mechanism. Diversity and inclusion as part of employee life cycle planning. What inclusive policies look like and the benefits. Something around the metrics for measuring your progress, monitoring and analytics. And finally, the community engagement that is necessary for making sure that, you know, diversity and inclusion continues, not just as a topic for one day, but as part of the normal way of running business. Next one. Now, if you picture um, the fact that all of us come to the workplace, actually all of us come to life, with very diverse you know, um, characteristics, let's call it that. Whether it be sex, whether it be race, whether it be um, you know, color, whether it be you know, genetics, uh, upbringing and all that, that's a diversity part. Now, the important thing in talking about diversity and inclusion is to take that mishmash of a puzzle broken up together in diversity and put it together into an inclusive workplace an inclusive environment such that you can deliver results with everybody participating. So I like this picture about the diversity we bring and how we can put the puzzle together and make sure that everything is coordinated by having an inclusive um, mindset. Next slide. Whenever there's a discussion around diversity and inclusion, there is quite a lot of you know, issues that Involved. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a complicated uh, subject, but it has many parts. It's about diversity and inclusion, of course, equality, gender, community, certain concepts about how you run your business, you know, thinking, you know, so you have to have a think tank to think out these things, policies, strategy. It's about life and it's about planning as well. So there's a lot, it's about teamwork. So there are a lot of issues that come into the overall conversation of diversity and inclusion. And I do hope that the panel today will do justice to quite a number of uh, these areas of thought. 
Next one. So I also think of diversity and inclusion as the nexus of a lot of topics that are being discussed right now. It's around globalization, technology. There is a change in demographics and employee expectations. There are younger generation of people coming in who have totally different expectations than you know, my own generation. There is clearly a talent skills shortage, uh, shortage and you know, we have to create inclusion to make sure that we bring everybody on board and you see what the benefits of doing that are. Next slide. Now, I said I would talk about inclusive leadership. And these are some of the parameters that are critical for anybody who is a leader who is driving diversity and inclusion. I say it's beyond intelligence quotient, it's beyond IQ. It's what I call the inclusive quotient. And it's about inclusive intelligence. And you know, there are a couple of things there that have nothing to do with your technical ability or your discipline ability. It's about empathy. That's a word too often misunderstood. But we will delve into it maybe in the panel session. Empathy, being able to empathize. That is a strong thing. And women do it better than men. And that's why when you have women represented properly within executive management, senior management, CEOs, and the rest of the team, empathy is not um, something that you will get away without having it. It's important to note this. Women are more empathetic. It's about self-awareness. You, as anybody who is involved in driving diversity and inclusion, must be self-aware yourself. It starts from you understanding where you're coming from, what, your tra what traditions and cultural issues that you have, and try and address that. Don't be blinded. Everybody comes in with some baggage into this conversation of diversity and inclusion. Now, if, if you're not self-aware, that baggage will never be let go of. Cultural wisdom, it's not just about culture. When I talk about cultural wisdom, it means that you are wise to the fact that people of different culture are working in the same workplace. So you are wise to the fact that there's a difference between the culture of person A and person B, and you understand that they have to work together. And so you create that atmosphere where all of them can thrive, irrespective of the culture from which they come. It's about accountability. You have to be accountable for making sure that you drive this inclusive intelligence within your organization. It's about leadership commitment and commitment across board. And finally, it's about engagement, it's about networks, about the things you say, about the things you drive in your organization. So you have to be engaging. You have to go out there and speak about it. And it's not, it's a choice I've taken that in driving diversity and inclusion within the oil and gas industry and within my own organization, I am committed to engaging, uh, talking, speaking, keynote addresses, panelists, whatever it is, engaging other networks and driving home this message. Next slide. Now, you know, like I said, when you talk about inclusive, um, you know, leadership, it starts with you understanding your unique situation. So take a look in the mirror, look at yourself, look at the things that are holding you back from driving this ethos of diversity and inclusion, and then start trying to address them. Look at the whole map, yeah? And then you build locally. So I don't come and talk about diversity and inclusion in the SPE family, or in the oil and gas industry, or an in industry at large, if I am not able to build locally, that is build within my own organization, and then make sure that I can connect the ideas, uh, the outcomes globally. So diversity network includes your self-awareness, understanding your unique situation, building locally, and connecting globally. Next slide. And you know, we have to extend this diversity discussion to clients and suppliers. So you, we, we actually have to take, you know, there's an active role we must play. So in my company, for example, when I have a lot of, you know, uh, people who are coming in as contractors and vendors, I don't only drive that diversity and inclusion discussion within the house, I actually drive it to our clients as well. So I want to see more women represented providing vendor and contractor services. 
and even in the companies that provide them, I want to see that they do have the diversity and inclusion ethos. So when we make these judgments, when we're making these assessments, these are some of the kind of things that we want to build. On. And there are a couple of things, you know, in this year around what you need to do. You need to stay competitive in a changing demographics. The demographics are changing and you must stay competitive. And that requires you understanding diversity and inclusion in your supply chain management. Growing profits and economic impact. You will see, and I'll give the last statement there, that there is a direct impact on your business if you, you know, encourage diversity and inclusion. Uh, can you all still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, just trying to make sure. And then there are certain ethical and business expectations that are required of leaders at this time. So I'll just give you a quotation from Michigan State University study. And it says companies who dedicate 20% or more of their spend to diverse suppliers can attribute as much as 15% of their annual sales to supplier diversity programs. Depending on annual sales numbers, uh, previous studies have put the return on investment of a supplier diversity program as high as 133%. So there is a direct impact on the business. So extend the diversity discussion to your clients and suppliers. Next slide. There is a discussion around role models that are critical. And this is one of my favorite you know, pictures. I show it time and time again. About some of the role models that we identified, whether it is Kamala Harris, whether it is Ngozi uh, Okonjo Iwala, whether it is uh, Ibuku Awosika, uh, these are, you know, women that we are very proud of, yeah? And that is because they are driving things in a world of men, and they manage to crack, shatter the glass ceiling by the things they do. But while these role models are critical for the young and upcoming women, it's also important to understand that they have a very strong support mechanism. So women in our industry who want to play a significant role in executive leadership, in senior management, must make sure, look back and say that there are men, whether they are in SPE or in the company, or even men at home, especially that, who are able to provide this support, the so-called he for she. Yeah. And if you have that kind of support mechanism, then, you know, the, um, well, the sky is your limit, quite honestly. Next slide. So let's go to how you integrate diversity and inclusion in the employee uh, life cycle because it has to be integrated into the entire employee life cycle. And there are a couple of things around things you have to do. It's about building a diverse slate in your selection process, in your job posting and recruitment process, in your talent management all around the employee. Make sure that diversity and inclusion are recognized within that. I have a policy in uh, Walter Smith that when you bring me anything around contracting, employing people, I say, if I do not see at least 50% of women on that list, you haven't even started. So I'm not saying I want to see 50% men. I want to see 50% plus women. So any list you bring to me that doesn't have 50% plus women, go back, start again, okay? You have to reflect your DNI strategy in your onboarding process. Look, onboarding, especially when you're onboarding um, uh, female engineers, it's not the same process as onboarding male. I'll give you a little anecdote. Um, we hired some, you know, quite a significant number of um, female engineers for our refinery. And then my very wonderful general manager HR, who, you know, basically we work in tandem, comes to me and says, yeah, people are complaining that between the time we interviewed the lady and the time we hired her, she got pregnant. What should we do? I said, uh, pregnancy is not a sickness. So, she starts her employment the same day as it was planned. She goes on maternity leave for whatever period. We pay her. And when she has given birth to her child, we celebrate her and bring her on board to start working. That's it. Discussion took less than five minutes. And so that's what I mean about the onboarding process. Be conscious about the differences. Embed this in all your learning programs in the organization. Hold managers accountable. Lead from the top. Because when the managers in my organization see the kind of things I'm doing, nobody in their right minds when trying to hire into their units will come to me with a list that are purely men. Nobody does that. So you lead from 
by example, you lead from the top and you hold them accountable in terms of performance management. You know, there are some little, you know, known biases. I look at performance management and the process and look at the outcome of performances and make sure that it's not that all the men are stars and the women are just, uh, you know, following behind them. There has to be a balance there as well. Employee de development. 360 degrees feedback is important to understand how you're, how you're doing. Provide broad opportunities and access in career development. Don't say that at this time, because this young woman is unable to go on a foreign assignment, that's it for her. No. If she has reasons why she cannot go on a foreign assignment, then understand those reasons and create that opportunity for her at the right time. And understanding that for men, it is probably easier to go on a foreign assignment with your wife and ask her to leave her job. It is more difficult to ask a married woman to do that. And therefore, in those opportunities, make sure that you, you know, take that into account and provide either the opportunity for the husband to develop himself or even get a job wherever it is they are going or constant visits. Make it easy for them. Don't create hurdles and say, well, men are doing it this way. Why don't you do it that way? Well, we are different for crying out loud. And expand your talent base and create inclusion when doing that in your succession planning, in your integrated talent management. Next slide. Now, these are some of the things you have to look at carefully when you're creating policies in your organization. I've, set, I've circled gender in terms of inclusive policies because that's actually what we're talking about today. But an inclusive workforce, there are quite a number of things. You have to look at background experience, industry persons coming from, family status, age, education, military service important as well, uh, thinking of personality styles, languages, race, ethnicity, office location is important that you, you know, when you're talking about this office location, you take into account the kind of, you know, diversity you want to create in your organization and make sure that feeds into where you assign people to and what office locations they are in, okay? So these are all the things you must cover to ensure that you have inclusive policies. Next one. And then these are the things that you must address. You must address diversity monitoring. You have to monitor diversity. Unconscious bias training. Look, uh, if men, women have an unconscious bias for women in the workplace, so you have to make sure that there is proper training to make sure that that unconscious, unconscious bias is understood so people can look at themselves in the mirror. These are the people issues you must address. Diversity monitoring, unconscious bias. In terms of engagements, equality impact assessment, you have to continue doing regular assessments, stakeholders, engagement, networks, community and charity, all the things you have to do around there in terms of engaging, make sure everybody understands the language you're speaking. And in terms of culture, wellness, awareness, acceptance and action, take action. And what I call FRED, Freddy is an acronym for fairness, respect, equality, diversity, inclusion, and engagement. Make sure that those are at the foundation of what you do when you're looking at cultural issues. Next slide. Now, the benefits and business impacts are very clear. This is from a Wood McKenzie, uh, McKinsey and Company, sorry, McKinsey and Company Diversity Matter um, uh, Survey, which was adapted by the World Trade Organization. It shows the likelihood of financial performance above national industry median as a percentage between the top quartile and bottom quartile performers in terms of diversity in, you know, women in the workplace. So top quartile are those companies that have a diverse workplace as judged, and bottom quartile are those companies that do not have a diverse workforce that includes women. This is all right. the first part of the chart is about women. And so it's executive gender diversity by quartile. And you can see that the people, the top quartile ones who are diverse outperform the bottom one by 15% in 2014. And by 2017, that gap had increased to 21%. So there is a direct business impact. The chart on the right is about ethnic diversity, which is also part of diversity and inclusion. So think about it in terms of, you know, an African woman or a Nigerian woman. These two aspects are important. The ethnic diversity when you're working in an international workplace and the gender diversity taken together. So the impact is significant if you take this into account and drive this within your business. Next slide. 
there are so many other you know business areas and improvements in business performance once you include a gender diversity the average return on equity sorry the next slide the average return on equity is much higher higher by you know on average about 47 percent from 15 percent to 22 percent the average earnings before income tax the margins the EBIT margin is higher by 55 percent from 11 percent to 17 percent and there are so many other things that you can look at in terms of the different areas that women have been known to impact the organization accountability direction coordination and control innovation motivation in the leadership team and these are all parameters that show the positive impacts they're all added up the positive impacts by having gender diversity within your business and improvements they uh, they lead to in your business performance next slide now here's what the worrying story is globally women represent 50 percent of the world's working population age population but generate only 37 percent of gdp there are 22 percent of women in ministerial and parliamentary roles worldwide 25 percent in management positions and by the time you get to the c-suite the executive suite there are only about five percent of women represented in top companies now what the world is losing is about 250 million workers that could be added to the labor force by 2025 and 12 trillion dollars that could be added to global GDP by 2025 by closing the gender gap. So there is an imperative business global to make sure that gender inclusion and uh, diversity and inclusion are part of business going forward. Next slide. Now I talked about the importance of monitoring and an analytics. So in the journey, there is a reliance on data, big data, Internet of Things, information technology, performance monitoring, business intelligence, business analytics, all those must feed into your overall business strategy. And social media is important as well. You, you know, people see me very active on Twitter and LinkedIn and creating that knowledge and trying to make sure that I can get data about other, how other companies are performing and what statements they are making, how they are engaging and all that. So it's important that you put in a monitoring and anal analytics unit that takes a look regularly and you can sit within your human resources department and takes a look a look regularly at how well you're doing you determine the metrics that you want to measure and you measure them and build them into that you know your uh, business strategy they are an integral part of your business strategy because you've seen what the impact on business performance is next slide the next is on community engagement and this is you know what i love about trying to say you have to engage the wider community and um, the I, I point out some of the communities that you need to engage women in energy oil and gas an important one women in energy network and then the, the he for she the united nations women's solidarity movement for gender equality i am a he for she and i'm very proud to state that sp international and sp nigerian council has girls in stem which they know i support year on year the girls in stem program especially with respect to internships of girls in STEM in Watersmith and the Women Development Program. The Women in Energy Network and the Renewable Energy Association of Nigeria is driving gender diversity and you know gender equality. And I think that is an opportunity when the energy transition is happening to make sure that more women come into the workplace in energy, in the energy industry. Next slide. Now about our own industry. Our industry lacks. It's it's rather serious. If you take a look at other industry, and this is OECD statistics, uh, natural sciences, maths, and statistics about fifty percent of um, you know uh, girls in STEM. Engineering twenty four percent, ICT nineteen percent. If you look overall in our industry, I heard the uh, uh, Mike talking about thirty five percent. I think within Nigeria, it is possibly less than thirty five percent in the very critical STEM areas of the business. So you see a lot of women in other areas and you know those are typical human resources, admin, legal and all that, but we want to bring in girls in STEM, women in STEM. We have to drive those percentages up. Our industry is not doing well enough. Yeah. And you know there are questions around how many women we have to bring into the uh, labor force. I've mentioned that 
and 13% of the global demand for graduate talent will not be filled in 2020. And those have to come from women. And it's growing and growing as we go ahead. Next slide. Now, um, I have two more slides before I finish. And the first one is on, you know, one of the sub themes, strategies for shattering the glass ceiling from the top. I am, you know, people are talking about shattering the glass ceiling from the bottom. I'm shattering it from the top in my organization. Yeah. And I hope more people are encouraged to break it from the top. Yeah, it's a little easier. You know, breaking from the uh, bottom seems, you know, you're stretching your hands so you don't have enough energy. If you're at the top, you're hitting down. Gravity will help you shatter them. Zero tolerance. Adopt zero tolerance policy. Yeah. Do not tolerate people who do not understand the reason, the requirements for gender diversity. It's not tolerated. I talked about my managers, my executive team members. They, they know that I do not tolerate them coming to me with uh, on, you know, issues that are not sensitive to gender, gender. Recruit and promote based on talent. Yeah. So it's not tokenism, but you have to make sure, and there are a lot of talent that every time we interview, every time we test, women are usually at the top. And we have to encourage them to come in and then drive that. Eliminate evaluation bias. When you're evaluating them within the organization performance, make sure that you do not have an inherent bias in that evaluation. Promote gender neutral networking. Listen, don't go to the old boys club where you people are doing funny things and you say that the organization is networking. There are gender neutral networking opportunities everywhere and leverage on them. So my executive team, my leadership team does not go to where only men are welcome. I wouldn't come anyway. Yeah. So when you do networking in the organization, promote gender neutral networking, provide flexible time uh, options for all. I don't look at my watch when people are coming to the office. Did this person come in at 7.30 or did they come in at 10? Well, I typically don't even come in until 9 o'clock and that is my entire career. So sorry. And that was because I used to go and drop my kids in school before coming to work. And if you, if you didn't like that, transfer me to another department. It was about my effectiveness at work and not what time I came to work. Encourage mentoring relationships. Create, you know, and this is from the top. Encourage them, yeah? New people coming to the organization, women, find mentors within your organization that can help them grow. Next slide. So shatter the glass ceiling from the top. That's what I encourage people to do. Now, a couple of the second something was about strategies for attracting and retaining the tech generation. So these are a couple of areas that I you know, want the panelists to deliberate on, you know, to deliberately create opportunities to support girls in STEM, to foster a community of practice, women networks, provide more informal work environments. It's important, yeah? Informal, women thrive in informal work environments, not this male dominated work environment where everything is work, 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 work all the day. You don't have any time for socializing. You, you, I mean, women would want the crash in the office. It's important, you know, for men and women, bring your kids to work. Yeah. I, I love it when I see the people in my organization bring their small children back from school, bring them into the office, and they say, ah, they want to go and see Uncle CEO. That's what I'm called, Uncle CEO. Yeah. So, you know, create that environment. Target professional development, targeted. Confront gender-based biases and provide supportive workspaces. Use targeted messaging and conversations to build interest and confidence. Targeted messaging right from the top. Encourage mentoring and role modeling from senior women in the organization and embrace work-life balance and family-friendly policies within your policies. Next slide. And then a couple of you know, simple steps in building a business case for DNI. It's it's difficult, but you know, you have to understand that there's a cost initial. Establish what the cost of building a business case for DNI is, investment of time, resources, but also ensure that while this is going on, that the cost of sitting still are clearly understood, the business impact. So I tell my board, we don't do this. This is what the impact is. So there is a cost of sitting uh, still. So compare that to the cost of taking action. Demonstrate potential benefits. I've talked about increased profitability, improved financial returns. Measurement and analysis, very clear throughout the life cycle. Diversity ratios across the functions and levels, pay levels, performance ratings, check for unconscious bias. And then start small. Don't um, overwhelm yourself. Pick a challenge at a time. 
don't be overwhelmed. Remember the metrics to track performance and continue to follow through on them. These are just four simple steps. Next slide. And then the next slide is my closing slide to say thank you for inviting me. And this is an award I received from the Women in Energy and the um, Renewable Energy Association of Nigeria. And it is a second uh, certificate of recognition for Watersmith as the best place for women to work. Thank you. And um, back to you, moderator. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. That was exceptional. Wow. What more can we truly ask from our uncle CEO? Thank you. That was eloquently delivered and you hit all the right notes. And just to summarize, I totally agree with you that we come to work with diverse characteristics such as race, religion, etc. All of this we have to piece together to work together to deliver. Irrespective of you know what baggages we are coming with, we all need to have that inclusive mindset. I also like the fact that you touched on inclusive intelligence. That was a new one for me. I mean, I know of emotional intelligence, but now inclusive intelligence, wow. It's not just um, technical skills, but the soft skills are important too. They matter, right? You talked about empathy and bringing a human fix, face to the mix. Okay, you also talked about um, self-awareness. Indeed, we all come together with different baggages and unfortunately we have to cohabit and make things work, right? So we have to find a way around it to make sure that, you know, everyone's issues, you know, as much as we can. Of course, we can't. Uh, yeah, it, it won't be all of the personal things, but, you know, it's good that, you know, we make room for some of these issues to, you know, to, to make sure that the employee or whoever that is going through them sort of, you know, is OK in the office and contributes um, optimally to the work in the office. So thank you for championing this in your organization, for sh shattering the glass ceiling from the top. I mean, in your office, you said that you have zero tolerance for any unconscious or anything going against um, diversity and inclusion in your office. That is um, awesome. Thank you so much. Now, you've also talked about uh, making your office more receptive to different challenges people face in their personal lives and even going the extra mile to challenge third party to imbibe the inclusiveness in their own organizations as well. You are you are truly our champion and we really, really appreciate that. OK, you also shared some women, women um, role models we are proud of. You talked about, you know, Mrs. Ngozi Okonji Wale and, and, and a bunch of others. Right. So these women, we already know, have very strong support system. So likewise, you're advising us ladies as well to seek out and build our own support system. OK, I'm truly taking notes, right? So you also shared some facts by um, Wood McKinsey and others, and these facts clearly showed the effect of diversity on productivity and ultimately on financials. What we cannot stress enough is the value of having a diverse team. It is very key in every single organization. You also talked about the need to join communities and network. So aside um, networking, we also need to motivate the younger girls to keep the spirit high. You know, they should see all of their all of their options available to them. And also, of course, they should know their rights as well. So thank you, Mr. Chikeze, for that excellent delivery. And I want to crave your indulgence to so please stand by while I introduce the rest of the panelists. OK, um, I'm going to be asking some questions. We have prepared questions and we have um, questions from the audience as well. We are hoping that you will still hang on and stay with us while we talk through all of these um, important things today. OK, so let's get into the panel session. Um, can I have all of the panelists show up their pictures, please, their videos, please? So welcome once again, everyone. And um, like it's been mentioned earlier on, we have two sub themes. The first one is women in the workplace, strategies for shattering the glass ceiling. And the second one is closing the workforce gap strategies for attracting and retaining the tech generation. Now, given the diverse nature of this panel, I'm sure it's going to be a rich and exciting conversation. So first up is Mr. Shei Adele. Mr. Shei Adele is the managing partner for Bucharest Energy Group. 
and contributes to a variety of companies in either advisory or consulting roles. He has over 30 years oil and gas experience with more than two thirds spent overseas. He holds a BSc in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Lagos and MBA from Edinburgh Business School, Herod Watch University. Mr. Shea is also a performance coach and certified strength development deployment inventory facilitator and has led many successful change initiatives. His passion for excellence and track record of identifying, developing and nurturing others has created value for others in the talent pipeline and has helped with his own career ambition of making a difference. Mr. Shea joins the forum today from the Pace Center City of Ibadan, where he is contributing to public service as special advisor public works and infrastructure to the oil state government. Mr. Shea, please go ahead and give us your perspective on women in the workplace, strategies for shattering the glass ceiling. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. That was a nice introduction. Most didn't recognize myself. <laughs> um, indeed, I have a few slides to share. Um, so if you can permit me to do that. When I first got the um, topic, um, it was earlier in the month, and it was to talk about women in the workforce. I was like, what do I know about that? What could I tell you about women in the workforce? But when I got the brief and it was talking about strategies for shattering the glass ceiling, I was like, okay, I like strategy. I love strategy. I teach strategy. Um, and I help individuals and teams in, uh, organizations to achieve the interest and so that got me really excited um, and excited. I think uh, Uncle CEO has touched on some of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and the perspective of uh, of of what we're talking about, the glass ceiling and people, and if there's if it's actually glass or brass, you're going to be talking about the society, the organization, the structures. Oh, the processes don't allow me. The procedures are such that I'm excluded. You're going to be talking about those types of tangibles. Uh, but I want us to kind of go down a little bit deeper. Uh, going to the level um, of self-awareness, and that was uh, part of what um, Chike talked about, and self-mastery. But it, 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 the dimensions are going to be around the behaviors we exhibit, uh, and the, the the values that drive those behaviors, and the beliefs that fuel the values, and essentially how we perform. Now, uh, the belief is that every organization or every unit has uh, operates like a pyramid. Uh, at the top, uh, there's usually limited space. And uh, as you go uh, down to the base, you, you find more room. So at any point in time, there's always going to be uh, one person at the top. Now, there's nobody here who would not have experienced uh, a situation where you've been asked to give up your space or your seat or even the opportunity for somebody else. Uh, we do that for a variety of reasons and it's not necessarily uh, bad, but it's sometimes a painful uh, thing to have to uh, go uh, experience. Uh, if you have to give up your, your seat for an elderly person, the boss, it's, you're still giving up something. Uh, even though that's that's rewarding because you know one day you're going to be older uh, and somebody might do that to you. Uh, it's a little bit more painful when you have to give up your ambition uh, for children or you give up ambition for a husband. But let's look at what you can do on the below the surface level uh, and it's going to uh, center around the mastery of you and becoming the best you can be because that's really uh, how to achieve in this environment. Now, everybody has a journey in life and the journey is usually um, towards a, a vision. 
So uh, sometimes that vision is known, sometimes it's not known. Uh, sometimes we help you find it. Uh, but it, it starts out with our vision of where you think you want to be. Uh, and then you create a mission to accomplish that. And strategy is the direction you choose uh, with that mission to get to where you're going. And the, the steps you take will be the execution. If, uh, if you want to use that cartoon as a, a way to describe life as a journey. You also uh, want to look at the work done by masters centuries ago, uh, looking at how we start out in life, which is also incidentally another pyramid. Uh, our journey ultimately culminates in a self-actualization uh, endpoint. And that's why you see uh, Bill Gates dropped out of school and he set up uh, um, a software company and he's, he's uh, an inventor and he's highly successful, the richest man on earth at some point. And then now he's getting fulfilled, um, influencing policy, influencing health outcomes across the world. And then you'll be wondering what's the correlation. But that just begins to tell you how uh, a vision around self-actualization can actually take you through different paths before you get to where you're going. And um, just as it is um, uh, quite the case that you would have preparation, you would have opportunities, and then you can get a placement, uh, sometimes you may not get the opportunity, but you are prepared. Sometimes you get the opportunity, but you're not prepared. It's best to be prepared, get the opportunity, and then you can fulfill that role. And the, the interesting thing about when you understand yourself, you are aware of yourself and your skills, uh, the interesting thing is, even if there's no space at the top of one particular pyramid, you can go to another pyramid, you can establish another pyramid, and really there's no limit, there's actually no limit. Uh, I was privileged to be part of the change initiative in Shell that allowed us to think beyond the limit. So we, we think as engineers at the mechanical limit, or the technical limit of, of engineering, but the, the methodology actually makes you think be, beyond limits. So you're beginning to think of, about the world in a perfect sense. And that begins, you, you begin to see uh, the potential in people differently. So when you're put in a particular position or you're kept in a particular place, you, you, you tend to see them in that position only, but not until you expose them to other areas, you're not able to see the full potential of the person. Now, uh, there's been a lot of people have done some studies into how people perform and how you can become a better performer. Um, people performance, they say, is a function of knowledge. It's actually your capacity uh, and your capability uh, and the opportunity to be able to do it. It's also a function of your attitude. So we, we believe that you develop skills from training and from experience and from hand-holding from other people, but you also need to come to the table with an attitude. Now, an attitude, let's say, is a function of the environment and your desire. Uh, some of these things can be tweaked, and you already heard um, the shattering from the top uh, concept from Chike. Uh, you can create an environment where you can thrive. I mean, the environment can be created for you, or you can even create it yourself. Uh, but then you come to that environment with a, a, a certain type of desire. Uh, I remember that the desires are fueled by your beliefs and your feelings. So uh, if you already feel, oh, I'm not going to be rewarded here. If you already feel that, oh, that company never does good for certain types of people. Oh, I'm black, I'm yellow. You, you already have baggage that may be destructive to your career journey. Uh, now, so in essence, um, for those who want to get fulfilled in a in a in a job, um, I mean there are different things you could do. You could be an employee, you could be a business owner, you could be an investor. Uh, however, you want to uh, get fulfilled, or you could just be a public servant. Now, a structured, based competency progression system always helps. You know, if the structure is there and you qualify, it's easy to kind of progress along that. But bear in mind, there's only going to be, as you rise, there's going to be limited space on top. 
But because you, you're so equipped, you're so great with your with your um, skill set, you can fit in almost any uh, other uh, environment. And that's probably where the key is. Um, also, we can we can tweak uh, performance and expected behavior by enabling the environment and reward uh, mechanisms a little bit differently. Uh, I won't dwell too much on this, but I mean it's it's a cartoon that just shows you you can you can drive behavior by extinction, you can drive behavior by punishment, you can drive negative reinforcement. But when you really want to tap into somebody's true potential and releasing the creative abilities, you know we were all born in the image of God, which means we we can there's nothing impossible for us to do. As a matter of fact, when we come together, it's it actually takes an act of God to to stop us from from uh, doing what we need, what we can do. Because if you remember the story of the Tower of Babel, it took it took uh, an act of God to to send us um, astray over there. Uh, so I think I, I I jumped a few slides ahead. Uh, this this slide uh, going from if you want Olympic type performance, you want to create an environment of positive reinforcement where the reward is presented and you know the there's a pleasant consequence uh, uh, for that um, activity. People tend to perform better there. Uh, I would like us to take a minute uh, to look at strengths uh, as behaviors. So each person has strengths. And we all have different strengths depending on how we've developed them or, or how we've paid attention to them. A good way to look at this is to think about anything you can do in your sleep without even thinking about it in your sleep. You can when you wake you up, you can get it done. Uh, it's, it's usually around the things that are very core to you. Um, so they are actions that you choose with intent of production. So you can either be doing that for yourself or you're doing it for others or for your organization. Uh, they are what people see um, and sometimes they can tell you, sometimes they don't tell you, but it is what you see. So it's represented like a buoy um, and a buoy, people, you get to see that, but you don't know what's holding it, you don't know anything about it. Uh, they can shift based on environment and based on situation. So sometimes the strength you exhibit in conflict is different from the strength you exhibit in, in uh, uh, when everything's good. So your motives actually strengthen, um, they anchor your strength, your strengths. They, they kind of give you the reason why you do what you do. Um, we know that behavior is driven by motives. Motives change in conflict or can change in conflict. Strengths can be overdone. Filters also influence perception. So what you see can be filtered by your own beliefs. Uh, we also know, uh, particularly with the SDI type of methodology, that people are motivated uh, by three main categories of, um, of um, three main dimensions, rather. Um, people can be motivated uh, to help other people, and you find uh, that with doctors and nurses and, and uh, firemen and things like that. Some are motivated by performance, just wanting to achieve results. Uh, we find that a lot in the army and some of uh, the, the way we drive uh, some of the oil companies. Uh, and then there are people who are motivated by process, just wanting to establish order, the society better, the, everybody in good harmony and things like that. And depending on, on where we are, uh, we are able to, to function differently. Now, why is this important? Um, you can master yourself. You can be the best you can ever be, uh, even if you work on your own uh, strengths. There, there's a tendency that if you're a very good speaker, you tend to want to speak all the time, even in meetings and stuff like that, uh, because you like the sound of your voice. It's your strength. You speak good English. It's your strength. But in a, in a team setting, that could be very destructive because then nobody else gets a chance to speak. Uh, and after a while, they're not really interested in listening to you any longer. Uh, and another strength is if you're 
the kind of person that is detailed oriented, you, you, you like to get to the bottom of things in a team environment, that could be construed as uh, nitpicking or over, over supervising. But why do I bring that up? Um, any of those things, if you understand them, can be better managed. And if you understand yourself and the journey, like I, I mentioned earlier, that you're on the go, you're able to, as a matter of fact, walk without the barriers and get to the fulfillment you, you desire, uh, uh, even within your own self. Um, and then when you begin to do that, you can expand that whole notion to the team and it can also be expanded to the organization. And I've seen that uh, in, in many organizations that I've been privileged to work with. Um, so that's where I want to kind of leave things. Um, I'll be glad to, to be part of the um, discussions and questions and answers. And um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shea. We appreciate your opening statement. Thank you very much. Um, the next up is B. B. Timelo. <laughs> so B. Timelo Selake Selak is an energy professional and founder of Selake Energy Solutions. She is the program chair for South Africa section. She is an activist for access to clean and affordable energy, an energy efficiency educator, an academia, and a social entrepreneur committed to the empowerment of women and youth in the oil and gas and energy sectors. Boy Butimelo has BSc honors in geology from the University of Pretoria with a BSc and MSc in engineering with specialization in oil and gas engineering from the University of Witwatersrand and a master of management in the field of energy leadership candidate at WIT Business School. Bitmelo, also, also please share with us on closing the workforce gap, strategies for attracting and retaining the tech generation. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Uji, for that great uh, introduction. Um, I'd like to just quickly share my screen so that uh, you don't have to be staring at my face the, the whole time. Um, let's see. I must say this is a great um, topic of discussion and I am extremely excited to, to be invited. Um, by yourselves to actually come in and share. Please let me know if you are able to see my screen. Yes, it's mellow. We can see your screen. Please go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Great. So this is a very interesting topic for me. And when one looks at, you know, uh, the tech generation, I would like to consider this generation more of a high tech generation. When we look back at a couple of years ago and, and how technology has really advanced in such a short period of time, we see that with the young generation, we are finding ourselves in positions where we really want to to leapfrog more than anything. We, we're not trying to, to play catch up, but want to leapfrog, especially when we are looking at how within the oil and gas industry, we are faced with the crew, the crew change, where there's a huge gap when it comes to you know, the workforce um, development and how one actually then uh, transitions or one actually fills in those gaps. So a few years ago or a few decades ago, the workforce looked pretty much like what we would call maybe in the, in the stone age where there was not much technology. Everybody depended a lot on just write me a letter, post it or mail it and I'll get it. Whatever you needed, it took five times or 10 times longer than it does today. Whereas now we are even getting away from emailing people. You know, we're moving into saying, hey, send me a text message, send me a WhatsApp or just ping me on, on Signal or on Teams. Life has become so much better. And these kind of technologies have really changed the way we look at the oil and gas industries and it has really reshaped 
our industry in ways that we couldn't imagine. So when you look at how these new technologies are shaping up the oil and gas industry, we see that this data analytics that are playing a big role, there's artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and um, you know when we look at cloud computing, it's taken me back to uh, you know 20 years ago where if I wanted to share information or share files, I would use a floppy disk. I don't know how many of you are as old as me, but um, we used to have floppy disks. You know when we used to have those big desktop uh, computers. That's how we shared, we stored inform information, we stored our files, and we shared that with the next person from across the the town or to the next country. But all of that had changed. We had pretty much graduated from floppy disks to CD-ROMs, where we then used that to uh, store our files and share our files. And then we moved on to those USB sticks to actually then share our files and store them. But now we are talking about cloud computing. You know, we're talking about storing everything on the cloud space where anyone from around the world can have access to the files that you're working on. You can work on those files live. And that's how technology have actually really advanced the way we, we operate within the industry. And with that in mind, we're also looking at how robotics and drones have actually played a pivotal role and how young people are coming in, the tech generation are coming in to say, hey, you don't need to be traveling hours and hours to go to a remote location just to go and have a look at the the, um, the pipeline to see if it's uh, leaking or if it's operating well. But we can use technology, we can use drones to go around and assess the fields, to assess the production fields, to check the temperatures, to see if our equipment are still in intact. And the gap that we are coming in as the tech generation to fill that in is very important for organization to actually realize that they need the, the tech generation within the organizations and it's important for them to start now putting measures into place to attract and to retain this new generation. So quite interesting as well is to say how do organizations actually come in and put strategies in place to attract and retain the tech generation? Well, first things first, and I think this is something that most of the oil and gas companies are almost sort of like missing that point, is to actually ask the tech generation, what do you need? What are you looking for within the industry or within an organization that will make you come to our side and also stay and play a big pivotal role in the energy transition, in actually developing and um, you know bringing in some uh, investments or some um, profits within our organization. So first things first, when you're asking the tech gen, what do you need? And it's very simple. They want to be trusted. They want transparency. They want to be flexible. I think it's um, Mr. Shea has also just um, mentioned that it is very important when one has flexibility, you know, and Uncle CEO also mentioned that, you know, when you're creating that entire environment within the workspace that allows you to bring in your kids after picking them up from, from, um, from daycare, just for that moment for you to finish off what you need to finish off. So this really took me back to say, how is our, how is my organization? How is the next organization that maybe my friends or my family members are working in within the oil and gas industry, creating that environment that allows one to be flexible to um, find some work-life balance and to be flexible to innovate, to be flexible to actually bring in solutions within the, the organization to say, listen, I have this skill that can help you actually leverage on, on it since I'm already here and grow your business or make more sales. So organizations need to start looking into that first and say, what are the needs of the tech generation? Currently now we are in the space of climate change. There is a big push for decarbonization and the young generation are here. The tech generation are here to say, we have the solutions or we have the ideas. Give us the platform. We want to be empowered. We want to be recognized help us help you include us as well in your decision making and in your strategies and most importantly good salary we all need good salary if people are paid well really they do well as it's not it's a ripple effect if i can put it that way 
So what can organizations further do once they've understood what are the needs of the tech generation? It's easy to actually attract um, the, the talent. It's very easy. Companies are coming in, they are putting a lot of effort to attract um, talent through their recruitment uh, campaigns and so forth. But the biggest challenge that um, we've seen and you know, when you're looking at um, research that has been done is on retaining the talent within the organization. And it comes back to saying, as an organization, what is your strategy? Have you done your SWOT analysis to say what skills do you need to move forward with your new strategy? If you don't have those skills in organization, how are you going to develop those who are already inside to have those skills? And most importantly, succession planning. For the new tech generation to feel like they are um, important, they are empowered to be recognized, they want to see the succession planning to see, am I working towards something? Am I creating an impact? Will I have an impact? You know, a career trajectory is very important because it does build our egos. And that also really motivates one to say, yes, I know I'm working towards X, Y, and Z. So definitely I am going to put on or put in those extra hours. Coming back as well to um, what the previous um, presenters have mentioned as well, it's important to have a diversity and inclusion policy within our organizations in the oil and gas industry. Because without those policies, then who is then accountable? Who is responsible for implementing those policies if they don't even exist? So those policies need to also align with the strategies of the different organizations so that it's implementable and somebody is also accountable to, for implementing those. Another thing I'd like to bring on is to say there is no one size fits all approach. So in the same breath as managers are trying to restructure the organization, they're trying to figure out what's the best uh, part of their of their team, what, what is the best skills that, that's required. It's important to identify as well what the employees or even the new uh, the tech generation are actually capable of doing and tailor make the training to what they already have. Not everybody wants to be a manager maybe, you know, so it's very important to understand that every individual will require a different type of, of training, different type of skills that they need to um, progress within their career. So without taking much of, of uh, the time, I just want to just bring it in to say that when it comes to strategies of retaining, um, attracting and retaining the tech generation, it really boils down to doing a SWOT analysis as organizations, as bringing down understanding what the tech generation actually needs and then merging that together and also ensuring that we are looking at multi-layered approach in the way we do recruitment, in the way we create uh, the career development within our organizations. That will really speak um, volumes and that will really um, bring in a lot of talent within your organization, especially when they are recognized and um, they are given the platform to innovate and be more flexible. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you Bitmelo. Thank you very much very for much that for opening. opening. So next so up is Zara. Zara. Um, before, um, before Zara comes Zara. up, I would really appreciate it if, um, just to say that we're not doing very well with time. And I was wondering that, you know, subsequently, if we could um, shorten our speech just so we can get um, into the questions, right? So Zara, let me tell you guys a bit, a little bit about Zara. Um, so Zara is a petroleum engineer with five years of experience working in the oil and energy industry on a variety of operational projects in Shell and Total. She holds MSc in Reservoir Evaluation and Management from Herotwa University and an MSc in Petroleum Engineering from Imperial College London. Zara is an active member of SPE International and has held several volunteering positions within SPE on local and international levels. She is a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion, expanding her efforts from advocating for gender diversity, serving in Women in Energy International Committee in SPE into the International Scheme of Diversity and Inclusion. She is the 2020 recipient of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Not See Young Member Outstanding Service Award. So Zara, your sub team is closing the workforce gap. 
strategies for attracting and retaining the tech generation. Please go for it. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, I think um, what you know, if I pronounced your name correctly, she covered pretty much a, like a great aspect of, of like the main challenges and how what strategies we can use to attain the tech generation. So I will try not to duplicate too much, but just give a general um, like overview or let's say my thoughts on how this works. I would start generally starting initially by talking about the oil and gas industry is now in the last few years going through a, a major transition, transitioning into aspect of transitioning into a more of energy, low carbon um, you know, emission and uh, toward a more sustainable energy. At the same time, they're they trying to adapt to um, you know, the uh, digital transformation in general. So there's a lot of things that's going in the oil and gas industry and it's changing the, the way the oil and gas industry has been known for the last many decades ago since it started. So this change will end up having the requirement or the demand for, the, for these companies for a new set of skills that you know the new generations the big newcomers were like about to get hired in these companies they need to be aware of in the same time so this is something related to the companies and how how things are changing in it if you are looking at it, at the new generation and how they are witnessing the news of these the whole transitioning of these companies in addition to that they witness and maybe they are very usually the you know the younger generation are really active on on the social media uh, and they witness uh, the continuous news uh, sometimes not very pleasant news from the last maybe 10 years with the cyclic, um, you know, um, um, thing in the oil and gas industry where, you know, people are start losing jobs and they, you know, get out of the, of the industry. So they start looking at it in a sense, do we really need to go and apply for technical jobs in the oil and gas industry? Or maybe since we are very good and technical um, in the tech industry, we will be, you know, heading to study some for example, if I talk about engineering, there will be there is a lot of reluctance from people to go and study petroleum engineering in a state that will would like to do and study uh, more of like computer science or and something related where they can open the door for them to work in other tech related industries and less to energy related industries. So this is make a bit of a gap. It's it's not only a gap in the sense of um, if if the that if that generation is really interested in being a part of the energy transition of the whole thing, and at the same time is uh, the fact for a lot of the fresh graduate now that they do they 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 feel there is a gap between the skills that they attained from education system and be, between what the new skills are required from these um, from the companies, including this transition. So I see in a general there is a responsibility in in order for us to attract and retain there is a responsibility. In the first place, by by the companies themselves to try to uh, put more effort into making you know the working in the oil and gas industry or the energy industry, which they are trying to make a reputation for, is more appealing for the new generation. And especially as we said, if they are very good in tech, and we want to, the main part of the energy transition is we are looking for uh, having you know a digital transformation, so they can add a lot in that aspect. And at the same time, we need to talk a bit more about the education system and how much they can need to be evolved in order to equip all the this new generation with the skills that are required for them to move uh, to be able to join the industry and don't feel there is a, like a huge gap. And one thing also I need to like so to to kind of shed the light on is the fact that um, we need uh, the new generation is like th there will be a, when they join the first time the industry there will be some kind of a gap. Um, a gap in a sense of inclusivity, you know, when you are the younger one in the in the room and uh, you know, you 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 do things in a bit differently. You are tech savvy. You may be very good with with technology stuff, but maybe you need to develop more of a skills in the sense of how you deal with the other um, team members are from different generations. So there is some work need to be done. Uh, and this is something we need to be done, like take a responsibility by, let's say, the management um, uh, who are leading these teams or sub teams to put more effort in making them feel inclusive. And this is will help a lot in retaining um, these, um, you know, uh, new generation in the industry. So I will close it here and we can move to the next speaker. OK, thank you, Zara. So next up and our final panelist is Mrs. Olusheun Sholanke Eboji. She is the head petroleum engineer in Oandu Energy Resources. 
So Lusheun heads the Petroleum Engineering Department at Oando Energy Resources Nigeria and is the leading independent EMP company. Olusharin has 20 years experience as a reservoir engineer working on assets in the North Sea and Niger Delta. Previous to Oando, she worked at Shell EMP UK and at NG in UK and France. Olusharin holds an MEng degree in petroleum engineering from Imperial College London. She is an active SB member, a wife and mother and lifestyle blogger. So Mrs. Sheo, please, you have the floor now. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll keep this short because luckily the panelists before myself have covered a lot of the points I want to make. Uh, but what's the problem? Mr. Chike spelled it out beautifully, which is that half of the world, about 50% of the world's population are women. And I have my own data from a 2017 Boston Consulting Group study, which corroborates what he showed that it's also about half of women, half of women from half of the population in institutions that are post-secondary. However, only a third of post-secondary education uh, women are in STEM subjects, which is science, um, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And why is that? We think, you know, the reasons that have been put forward is that uh, some of them are cultural. Uh, some of them we know is uh, because the industry itself has a history of not promoting imagery that has appeared conducive to women. Um, women are biologically programmed to be nurturers and, you know, perhaps considering uh, career options in locations of extreme weather, harsh waves and desert, doesn't necessarily endear women to the industry, but I know a lot of that imagery has changed now. Also, representation matters in the past. The imagery the industry has shown in the past has not necessarily been conducive to women. He's also spelled out the costs um, to business, um, and I have equal, my research equally supports that, as well as the loss to society at large. There's an Accenture study, um, when, when she rises, we all rise, that you know talks about this beautifully, which is that women are the bedrock of society. If we leave women out of um, of of commerce, the society suffers generally, and we see that a lot in Africa on the continent. And just to go back to Mr. Chike Moses' um, um, presentation, he he allowed us to imagine the juxtaposition of um, the business loss uh, or and societal loss. For, for gender as well as for, for women of color. So you can imagine in a country like Nigeria where the majority of the revenue the country makes um, is from the energy industry, there's a significant loss to businesses and societies by leaving women out. So to the strategies, what can be done? I'd combine both Mr. Chikis and Mr. Adelia's um, uh, points, which is that it is two-pronged. It must first of all be from um, the corporation, um, creating an enabling environment for attracting and retaining women. And I hope we get to touch on that a lot more when we're doing the questions. The second issue is also from the women, you know, what they need to do to um, enable themselves, uh, because sometimes like Mr. Shea said, you have to create the right environment. So it's a two prong. Both actors have a role to play here. Um, so I'll, I'll close on those notes. Um, hopefully get a chance to say more um, when we're taking the questions. All right, thank you so much. So let's go into the questions now. And Sheon, since you are the last to speak, you are going to be the first to answer my questions, right? <laughs> so the first question I have is, um, as a young girl growing up, you know, in school, back in school back then, um, if you're a good girl, if you're nice, if you're, I mean, girls are usually compliant and easygoing. They're just so easy to manage, right? And they make the good grades and stuff. Now at work, these qualities don't seem to get us that much reward. So in your opinion, right, I want to, as, an, as a senior management as well, I would like you to, I know you've talked on some of the strategies, but I also want you to tell us how it has been, exactly how you did yours, how you were able to, you know, go from being um, the nice girl to a badass, you know, to get, you know, to that thing that you really wanted. Um, yeah. Could you um, enlighten us some more on that? 
your own personal experience. Okay, my personal experience. So I actually think that being nice and compliant are great qualities for anybody in any organization, um, whether you're male or you're female. Um, what is important is that, uh, and it's been mentioned before, this inclusive intelligence, where, where you value all of these attributes in people. Um, you need to have empathy and that has been you need to have empathy you need to be relatable as a leader you really cannot have a very um a very functional team if if a leader doesn't have this attribute so i don't think the problem is being nice i think the issue is um placing being nice above business exigencies is the issue we're talking about here and i think that over time you just learn to 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 do better at it i i think it can actually be having a little bit more um soft better soft skills can can be uh an advantage for an organization as for me i i think the challenges i would say i had faced were more around um self-doubt and I got a lot of help with that. I got uh, some professional coaching um, and, you know, I didn't necessarily felt like I belonged in the industry. I uh, there was a perception that had been created in my head that women didn't belong and maybe women who also a bit like me. So I was introduced as a lifestyle blogger. You know, I wear makeup. I am feminine and I'm proud to be feminine. Um, and there was an impression that was you know that that i felt that perhaps there wasn't space for women like me in the organization especially leadership um however over time i've just learned to embrace my personality my and we've all spoken about self-awareness and know your value so basically what you need to do is understand the value you bring to the table right at the end of the day the oil and gas business is a business like any other and what they care about is the bottom line so what you need to do is recognize what you bring to the table so do document and broadcast your worth i think that will get you a long way in shattering the glass ceiling <laughs> okay that's good to know i i somehow know that um there are some environments or office environments where you know the women they have to do extra right you know you know to sort of be seen be more visible right you know they have to give in that extra thing or do the extra effort right to get you know their self seen and all of that but now that you've said it you know i mean being nice is also good compliant and all of that but it's more about you also knowing your values knowing what works for you and going for it as well right now um mr shay just um to go over to another topic well same topic but you know uh, from another um perspective um i wanted to find out from you so with all of the facts shared by um yourself by Sheung, by mr chikese i was wondering why is it that companies are slow to key into all of these facts they've shown that you know uh, with women with diverse team etc you you know yeah, it tends to uh, um increase productivity in organizations and probably you know lead to find a better financial result yes companies are kind of slow why is that mr shay yeah my internet is uh, a little bit slow um so it might come out choppy um for me um and it's proven diversity implies a blend of a variety of things uh, from skills uh, a variety of perspectives, a variety of exposure, thinking, um, backgrounds, uh, just like cookies and cream. Uh, when you're able to uh, blend it all together. Um, you can also see from the COVID response, uh, different leadership styles, and you can tell from the outcomes that um, a, lo a lot more diverse um, perspectives kind of uh, led the pack of the world in 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 such uh, pandemic situations uh, i think companies are slow if they are slow um deliberately um either because they are not learning uh, because some of the statistics um, and some of the value that can be imputed to diversity versus non-diversity is, is quite clear um, and some are just not aware they're doing things like they've done for centuries. 
and they're just not ready to to change uh, which leads to the perception of risk and the ability to take on risks so um, some just want to remain the way they've always been as against taking on new dimensions and to to buttress that fact so think about <coughs> the military um, thinking more diversity and how how much risk is that for them for that industry um, you know but then these topics are exactly why paid consulting industry exists to to bridge the gap um, so when when a an industry when a um, an organization is ready for it there there's help uh, available to help um, to help them uh, through the process but it, it's it's clear in my mind it's um, and it's uh, provable all across the world that diverse diversity is the way to go all right thank um, you. yeah thank you um okay it's difficult it's i mean it's <laughs> for you to say that um you know companies organizations are some they are just reluctant to get on the on the on the, on the train right you know they're, they're just they, they're sort of set in their ways and i see mr chikese the way he described his own organizations you know and all of the things he's trying to implement to make sure you know he achieves um, diversity and inclusion I, I i wonder why these other companies cannot see it that way why it's um it's i mean they are so just so slow to it as well i mean you have your traditional way of doing things but you know the, life has changed the world is moving on why is it that these companies are not changing as well so mr chikese i wanted to find out from you you as a person you're doing this for your organization do you have um um, should, likely advice for um, other organizations, you know, why they need to get on, hop on this, on this train as well, just like yourself is doing. Do you have any advice or anything to say to them? Yes, um, just very quickly. You know, um, I think it was Shane who talked about the fact that, you know, oil and gas business is like any other business about making profit. Um, but, uh, people need to understand that um, the most important resource you have in any company are the human resources. And the most um, effective human resources are the, uh, the ones that reflect the uh, diversity in the society. And that includes uh, gender diversity. Um, these statistics are there, they don't lie um, in terms of the impact to your business. I can tell you that, uh, for example, the kind of results we achieved uh, in Walter Smith in 2020 um, lend itself to the same narrative about the fact that, um, you know, a diverse and inclusive workspace will deliver for you, you know, um, amazing business results. Now, now that's where the challenge is. A lot of uh, people um, or leaders in organizations, a lot of companies, don't yet see that and you know it worries me why they don't my executive management team is enriched because we have half of them as women half of them as men and let me tell you something the um the men in my executive management and leadership team um some of their excesses and you know <laughs> that includes me are curtailed because of the presence of the women on there. There are certain things, you know, when a man is asked a question about um, a project or something, he's very able and easy for him to say, yeah, 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 I understand it all, it's done. Strange thing is that um, the women who are on my leadership team will then ask certain questions that kind of expose him finally that, yeah, you haven't done anything, you're just saying it, yeah? So it's okay, it's done. Um, you know, how did you do this? How did you do that? And they come from it from the perspective that they are trying to learn. But then it exposes that this macho, you know, attitude of the men that they've done it, that they haven't actually done anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, there's that blend, which, look, I as CEO, I enjoy it a lot. I'm not sure about my male colleagues, <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely, I absolutely <laughs> thrive on you know watching those um you know conversations going on yeah and mm -hmm. i can see it you, you know 
quite honestly, uh, uh, Obiru, I can't answer this. I can see it. I can see the business impact. I don't know what other people are seeing, you know, mm. and that is preventing them from this. And, you know, the one important thing that, you know, I'd like to add into the conversation. There's a narrow line between male chauvinism and chivalry. Yeah? Let me make it clear. There's a narrow line. And, uh, you, you know, it's about self-awareness. And I want to make sure that people understand this. I, I read one young lady in STEMS, um, you know, something she put out in LinkedIn about the fact that when she first resumed in the field mm. and she was going to, you know, work with one heavy piece of equipment, that there was a young man there who, as she was trying to move the equipment, said, ah, let me help you and carry it. Yeah? Now, mm -hmm. from his own perspective, he was being... Chivalrous. From her own perspective, she was being a male chauvinist because, you know, she wanted to lift it herself. Yeah. And yet he stepped in. So, you know, it's that interplay. Men have to understand, yeah, that yeah. if your support is not required, if it's not requested, yeah, let the women get on with it. And this is one of the things that I keep saying that uh, the fear of organizations, of having women in senior executive positions, is whether or not the CEO, who is usually male, and that will have to start changing, whether he's accepting of the fact that the woman is his equal. Mm -hmm. You understand that? Yeah. That, that self-awareness has to be clear. The woman is his equal, if not his superior. So wh where's my experience from? I keep telling people, I grew up from a family where mom was a professor, dad was a professor, no difference, yeah? Oh. My sisters, one is a professor of medicine, the other one is a, I mean, there was no boys wash cars, girls cook, I learned how to cook. So yeah. all those kinds of things, that's how I, that's how I grew up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then my most important manager in my career was a woman. Wow. The best, the best manager I've had was a woman. She mm -hmm. was the one that recognized my talent, let's call it that, and then pushed me forward in a multi-ethnic society. This was Shell in the Netherlands. And I'm forever grateful to her for picking me up and saying, hey, you're better than most of these people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So who am I? I keep asking, who am I not to be able to reflect these same choices within my organization? And I hope mm -hmm. other people are able to do that and show that there are business results tied directly into that diversity. Sorry, yeah. I'm talking too much. I'm too passionate about <laughs> this. Too, you know. so you are. Don't you're invite me again you if you don't want to hear me go on about. <laughs> you definitely are. Excellent stuff. Thank you. So you touched on, you know, men recognizing that, you know, the woman is their equal. And you even said probably even more. <laughs> uh, how did you put it? Um, better than the men. OK, let's leave that aside. But you touched on the fact that, you know, men need to recognize that women are their equal. Now that this leads me to the next question. And Bitimelo, this is for you. OK, we know that there are social and there are cultural barriers, especially for we Africans, you know. We see sometimes, at least from where I, I come from, right, it's almost like the woman is has to be submissive, has to be under the man, you know. I mean, there's no way the woman can do better or as good as the man and all of that. So I, want, I was wondering, how do you um, uh, move against this sort of barrier? What, what do you advise women to do if they experience such a thing in the office? Thank you for that question. And it's, it's very important, actually, because it really boils down to how we we as women uh, see men as well, whether it's outside of the working environment or, you know, inside our homes. But what's important as well is to to call it what it is. You know, uh, the moment you see for, for, for me, you know, the moment I see I'm seeing that, you know, um, my male counterparts, um, you know, they're not treating me in in an equal way or they expect me to be more submissive. I'll call it out and I'll say it like, listen, I'm not your wife. I'm not your sister. You know, here we are all equal. We all went to school, got the same degree. We're trying to really get the work going. We're trying to make money for this organization. You know, so it's really about calling it out and not uh, just pretending. I think that's one thing that we, we do that mistake is that we just push things aside for the sake of peace in the workspace, but sometimes there, there are ways to actually address uh, the situations without coming out as, as too sensitive as they will say it, but um, in really addressing it in a more authoritative way, have that authority to to call it out and, and just, um, excuse their friends, I will say just nip it in the bud while yeah. it's still fresh, like right there, you know, um, and make sure that 
you know they they learn at that point and it will mm-hmm. never it will not be repeated again yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay i'm just wondering do you have any short personal experience so far that you can share with us just something really short and quick otherwise we move on that's fine as well. <laughs> <laughs> i remember when i used to, to to work for baker hughes and i used to work in the in the in the shop you know uh, assembling and dis- disassembling tools uh, i think i was in, in in bakersfield and you know you're trying to jump onto the pipe uh, on the pipe range to break a connection and one of the guys will come he's like no no no, no don't do that you're gonna hurt yourself let me help you I'm like no i didn't ask for your help I'll do it. <laughs> you know, go about it, break the connection and be done and be like, do you still want to help me? So it's just one of those things where you just take, <laughs> take, just be confident in what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Zara, let me come over to you and on the sub theme you talked about. So there was something you mentioned about uh, interest, right? So we've talked that, I mean, you and Bitmelo, you will finish the work, like you gave us all the strategies the recruiters can use to attract and then retain the tech generation. Now, you, you mentioned um, the interest of the tech generations themselves. Are they really interested in the oil and gas industry? Are they, I mean, because uh, for me, I have a niece that, you know, she, yeah, yeah, she's reading engineering, but she, she really loves doing her thing in YouTube. And she's like, why do I have to continue with engineering? I mean, I'm doing so, I have so many views, I'm getting some money from <laughs> YouTube. So why then do you need me to continue with this engineering, right? So I was just wondering, what is it that you, uh, you know, we really need to tell this young generation to, you know, to, to entice them to really, really come into this industry? So this is the thing, you can start with the communicating with them with their own language. Like I noticed them with the many, let's say, younger generation, uh, when I talk to them, they are really interested in all the, you know, technology stuff, you know, they know, very much about the latest technology release, about video games, about stuff. So the best way for you to attract them, and I mentioned something in the, in, in the industry, in oil and gas industry, we're having a great transition now into, um, uh, you know, uh, using the, you know, um, um, they call it the transformation, the, uh, the digital transformation. The digital transformation, all the application of AI and robotics and the stuff, this need people who are really aware of the technology. And I don't see a better, you know, nominees for this than the new generation, you know, because they, they are very aware of the technology at a very young age. So you can attract them by, you know, using the skills that they already have and they, they enjoy doing that and, you know, being up to date with the latest, you know, even with the video games, they, with they work, they do coding. So it's not like they are not very intimidated about this shift as maybe as is it the case with a bit of the older generation. So you can, you know, use these skills and you tell them, oh, you, you can, you can be a part of the whole transitioning. You are, can be a part of the movement of the entire industry to adopt this uh, digital transformation. You will be a part of the transition of like the oil and gas industry and more of like sustainable energy industry in general. So it's, it's one of the way to do it is like this, to uh, attract them to the industry. And then maybe the second way is if we are talking about retaining them and you know keep them in the in the position when we after we recruit them is we need to try to see what the way to communicate with them i mentioned something about inclusivity and so it is important because they are very social mm-hmm. i can notice they are very social you know they have a you know they sometimes can they can talk to you and you will see oh, oops uh you know maybe they are they just need a bit of training about you know soft skills and communication because they can be very friendly you know and that in a workplace sometimes can be a bit um tricky you need more of a let's say more of a shaving and, and um uh you know a bit of mentoring to it um and then you for the let's say for training part you try to train them um in not a very old way but in the way that they're, they're more happy with it which is do training online which they like it with a certificate and recently i've been noticing that many of the training courses they start doing it in a more of they call it a gaming like aspect I mean, when you do course, you finish it, you get, you know, level two, level three, like a winner. It's something similar to what they do when they play video games. It mm-hmm. can be a bit of symbol, symbol like aspects, but this is you are talking to them with their own language. Mm-hmm. Um, you get the best out of it. OK, cool. All right. Thank you. Um, we're not doing very well with time, but um, there's a question from the audience. Let me take that before we uh, I wish we could go on and on, but I don't know, we're out of time kind of. So let me take this question first of all. Let's see how we go with that. So this question is for Mr. Chikezie and he says, um, it's so amazing to hear what you are doing to engage as many women in value chain. The 50-50 model is incredible. You are truly a he for she champion. I also love Freddie. 
I am curious though, you had said when the energy transition is happening and it got me wondering if you think it is yet to start. Could you kindly clarify your thoughts? Has it started or not? Mr. Chikese, that is for you. Thank you. Uh, the energy transition has started. Um, sometimes when I use that language, it's about what Africa needs to do first. Africa has not consumed enough energy to start talking about jumping on that train head first. So that's why we have the decade of the gas. The way Africa is going to transit is not to immediately go to renewables from um, fossil fuels, but to use the cleaner fossil fuel, which is gas, as a transition energy and then continue to renewable. So I, I say the transition has started, but not the renewables transition. That is still to come in Africa, but the gas transition has started. Now, there are little pockets of renewable work going on here and there, yeah? Mm -hmm. But the way I think about when things start in Africa is when there's a policy in place. There is, not to my knowledge, any policy, formal government policy in Nigeria about renewable energy. And without a policy framework around it, it's just sim simply individuals doing their own thing. So um, the transition has started globally. Africa is yet to catch up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Um, so, with Melo, this question is for you as well. It's, um, it says it's an awesome session, amazing talking points on the strategies you shared, right? So the person is asking, what are the prospective systems in view or in place to drive these efforts to include the new generation? Thanks, Uju, for that question. Um, that's a very important question, actually. Uh, there are various systems that are in place. I, I guess the, the difference comes in when you're looking at the different companies as to what are they willing to pay for and what systems are they willing to integrate within the organization. I mean, you, you have um, uh, some organizations where they have a very strong talent management system or the HR department is so strong that they have their own internal systems in place that's tailor made for them. I guess uh, to my point as well with the strategies is to say, let us not try and put a blanket approach to the solutions that we're trying to, to, to create within our organizations because every organization is, is different, but um, the strategies are similar. But when it comes to the systems, it's important to really tailor make those um, uh, plans to your organization and the strategies that your organization actually aims at achieving. So I, I don't have a, a straight answer to that because it really depends on the organization itself and what it is that they want to achieve in terms of doing the, the whole um, diversity and inclusion and attracting the, the tech generation. Ah, OK, thank you. That was a good one. Good response to that. And hopefully, um, dear Sue Christian, I hope um, you were answered, um, you know, you got your response properly. Um, well, I had a full pack of questions, but as it is, the time is against us, right? And right now, I'm going to hand over to OG. OG is our section director, and OG will summarize and wrap up the discussion for us. OG, OG, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, uh, this has been such a wonderful um, <laughs> session for me, and it is because I mean it's great to see Botimele again. Hi, and it's great to see Shewe again. So hi to Shewe as well, and of course Chike, and of course also the, the all the other uh, panel members as well. We're eternally grateful to you for always um, accepting to speak at our events. You guys really bring a level of richness and wisdom to our members and to ourselves. I have my book and my pen, I was taking down notes here and there because it's important for me as an emerging leader in the oil and gas industry to also, you know, reflect on what um, is important to, to in, in the struggle. I mean, as a female, yes, maybe on some level, I'm a recipient of it, but I'm also, you know, in a position to now begin to propagate it, you know, down the line as we go towards the younger generations as well. We all have to live the walk and, and live the talk. So I'm really very grateful to all our panel members for for the time they've spent here today. And uh, I appreciate you. And uh, please always keep your door open to to us. Thank you. I'll hand over now to uh, Princess. Thank you very much, Uji. 
So we'll be taking the announcements now. And we have a uh, very exciting member benefit programs that have been planned by SB Lagos section. OK, so um, just following this uh, diversity and in diversity and inclusion event, we have a technical lecture for March 31st. It's just uh, next week. It's titled Signatures of a Horizontal Well Completed Near a Ceiling Boundary. It will be our March technical lecture, and that will be taken by Professor Steve Adewale. Uh, April 1st, we would be having a distinguished lecture series by John Clegg on well placement, where are we headed, and why non-drillers should care. We also have a Young Professionals Forum titled Creating Your Own Opportunities in the Energy Industry, and that will be taking place May 1st. There are so many events that SP Lagos section has already put in place, and we'll ask that you keep tabs of all those events uh, through our communications via email and on social media. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Fayama to take us further. Thank you, Princess. I would like to truly appreciate everyone who has made today's event a success. I hope you enjoyed the very informative session, the excellent delivery from our suite of resource persons. My name is Fayama Okoli, Programs Chair of SPE Lagos Section. And on behalf of the organization, I give a vote of thanks to every single person in today's event. First and foremost, thanking SPE for the platform to deliver these topical discussions. To our keynote speaker, Mr. Chikeze Wosu, our wonderful panelist and moderator who have driven diverse perspectives to the theme of discussion today. To the Lagos Section Chairperson, Mr. Michael Oyere, and the organizing committee of this event, led by Mrs. Priscilla Nwere. I say a big thank you. This event wouldn't have been possible without your support. We would not have had a successful day if we did not have our special attendees with us. So to everyone who had made out time from their busy schedules to join us, we sincerely appreciate you. Thank you for making it today. And just before we round off, I would like to invite you to follow SPE Lagos section on all our social media handles. We are present on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can connect with us, follow us, and share our publicity uh, material to everyone uh, you have in your contact list. So we all learn together and grow together in the industry. Thank you and have a brilliant day ahead. Would you over to you? Yeah, thank you so much, Fireman. Thanks everyone for attending. Our guest, our special um, guest of honor and our panelists, we really thank you and appreciate you all. So thanks everyone. and. Hope you make time to join us in subsequent events. Take care, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Thank very you much. Bye. Thank you.